Okay, thanks. All right, so we'll start in about 30 seconds. Give everybody a chance to, to join and uh, get settled in. And same rules as before. We kind of just field questions as they come up and field the chat. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and there's my phone telling me that it's one o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, this is the second webinar for the Stanford Biodesign Innovation Fellowship. And this is a webinar focused on uh, a panel of alumni talking about both their experiences in the fellowship as well as how the fellowship impacted their career trajectory. And so I'm really excited to, uh, uh, to welcome our, our panel here today. So we have Rush, Vic, Shreya, and um, Vivian. And I'll let each of them in, uh, introduce themselves in just a moment. Let me start by giving you an overview of how we're gonna run this webinar. Uh, it's a little different than the first webinar that we ran, which was much more about uh, telling you how the fellowship year works. This webinar is focused on answering your questions and getting deeper into the details of what it's like to be a fellow. And in particular, also to give you a flavor of what it means to come from the various different backgrounds uh, that many of our fellows come from and where those fellows take the, the, the experiences at Stanford as they progress their careers forward. So we'll start off with introductions. Then we'll do some roundtable questions. The intent here is to go through about the first 20 to 25 minutes with those roundtable questions. And then we'll start pulling the questions that come up in the, the question and answers. So if you have questions for the panelists, please add them to the Q&A. And we'll start flagging those and answering those uh, at about 20, 25 minutes through the webinar. And we'll stay on until we've uh, answered everyone's questions or we hit our one hour time limit, whichever comes first. So thanks everybody for joining today and, and we'll kick this off. Uh, let me start the introductions by introducing myself. Uh, I am Sandy Ruggles. I am one of the assistant directors for the Innovation Fellowship. Uh, a brief background on me, I have uh, was trained initially as a scientist. I have a PhD in biophysics and got interested in innovation through work after my PhD uh, with a biotech company that, that I launched out of my PhD research. I came to Stanford in 2009, 2010 for the fellowship year then and used the fellowship as a way to transition into medical device and into strategy and marketing. So these days I am a consultant for mostly small and medium stage med tech companies focused on the areas of strategy, commercialization and product. All right, I'm gonna sign uh, uh, some introductions here. If you guys could give just a quick one to two uh, minute introduction of yourself. We'll kick off with Rush. Hi, I'm uh, Rush Bartlett, um, one of the associate directors of Biodesign, helping on the corporate education side. Um, and then my main job is I'm the chief product officer for a company called Lansino Laboratories, uh, which is one of the main uh, women's health and breastfeeding companies um, nationally. Um, prior to that, um, sort of, I was a chemical engineer. I got a PhD in biomedical engineering and a master's in business coming into Biodesign. Um, out of Biodesign, we had um, three uh, projects uh, that, that spun out into various um, levels of, of achievement afterwards, uh, two on the medical device side that were acquired, and one on the healthcare software side, um, which is a company still operating um, called Vinca Health, which has about 70 employees. And um, can't say enough about the program, truly changed the trajectory of my career from being probably would have, I would have maybe been a senior engineer at this point <laughs> in some big <laughs> tech company uh, versus um, what I'm doing now. So, so uh, definitely recommend applying. And then I'll hand it over to Vivian. 
Yeah, it's so nice to um, be here and uh, share a little bit of my experience uh, uh, on the fellowship and my career pathway afterwards. Um, I'm Vivian Dreiser. I'm uh, originally from the Netherlands. Uh, I did the fellowship in 2016-17. Um, I'm a physician by training. Um, and when I uh, went into the program, I already had done a, a, a fellowship at the surgery department at Stanford as well. And uh, when I went into the, the program, I uh, completely changed my career trajectory uh, and decided to uh, not pursue a clinical career, uh, but focus on healthcare technology afterwards. Um, currently, I'm a senior manager at Benop Phelps & Phillips, which is a, a law and a professional consulting services firm uh, located throughout the United States. I'm located in their uh, SF office um, and part of their digital health team. Uh, I mainly uh, focus on uh, digital health type of products and services uh, and work with um, pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies on use market entry strategies um, and M&A uh, uh, analysis. Um, that's probably in a nutshell about my background. Um, for the fellowship, we, um, so we worked on a cardiovascular project. Um, afterwards, one of my teammates uh, decided to continue with it. Uh, took it forward and then after uh, two years uh, decided to, to eventually kill it. I'm uh, happy to kind of discuss through like that experience if anyone is interested. Um, I'll hand it over to Vic. Hello everyone, I'm Vic McCray. Um, first of all, thank you Sandy for setting this up and inviting me to join. Uh, I'm currently serving as one of the assistant uh, directors of the Innovation Fellowship alongside Sandy. Um, I completed the Biodesign Fellowship in 2010 and, uh, to 2011. Uh, I'm a general and trauma surgeon by background. Uh, for our year of the fellowship, um, our team was placed in the field of ophthalmology and two companies uh, spun out of uh, our team that year. One was acquired. Uh, the other uh, I'm currently serving as CEO of uh, in the contact lens space. Um, I have a hybrid um, career where I continue to, to practice part-time in trauma surgery um, while continuing to run the company uh, as my quote-unquote full-time job uh, in addition to teaching at Biodesign. I'm really excited for all of you who are watching the webinar and, and excited to engage with you and answer any questions that you have. Uh, I'll pass it on to Shreya, not uh, last but definitely not least. <laughs> Thanks, Vic. Yeah, I'm, I'm Shreya Mehta, um, did the fellowship program 2013-2014. Uh, um, prior to that, I'm a, a biomedical engineer by training um, and studied uh, biomechanics, specifically first musculoskeletal biomechanics, then cardiovascular biomechanics, um, and also uh, worked as an engineer in industry um, with that skill set. And then um, I transitioned to more of a regulatory role. So I worked at FDA for about four years, um, reviewing applications that companies have submitted related to initiating a clinical trial or um, a commercial application submission. Um, so was a lead reviewer there and led teams through the decision-making process of, of whether to approve or deny um, a clinical trial or a commercial application, um, which was a, a great, um, great experience and, and definitely an asset to, to my career. So um, following that experience uh, applied to Biodesign, thankfully got in um, with this esteemed group of people that you see here. Um, and and um, currently I am in uh, the position of, of chief technology officer at a company called Zenflow, which is a company that we founded out of the Biodesign Fellowship. So um, currently I, I run the engineering team um, we're about 30 employees now full-time and uh, entering our, our big pivotal clinical trial this year um, and excited to be here with you and, and share my experiences through biodesign and uh, happy to help. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to do a, about a two-minute overview of the fellowship uh, for those of you who haven't either investigated it uh, through the website. I would encourage you to look more deeply there. If you want a really deep dive into it, our previous webinar that was led by James Wall uh, goes through the fellowship year in, in significant detail. 
But just as a, as a reminder of, of what this fellowship is, it is a 10 month academic year program that is focused on teaching you the biodesign uh, process through a hands-on experiential learning uh, style of education. So when you come to biodesign, the, the fellowship starts the beginning of August. And in August, that's when the clinical area that you will be focusing on for the year is revealed. And you start a, a one month boot camp experience. During boot camp, you learn about the clinical area, um, especially those people who are not clinically trained. This is your chance to really learn the anatomy, physiology, and uh, uh, and, and disease states that are important in that uh, in that clinical focus area. You also will get a number of lectures from members of the biodesign community about the process itself and the different components of the process. And just to give you a chance to get your feet wet, you also do a mini project over the course of that month that takes you from start to finish of the whole process in, in a very compressed timeline. Once that first month is over, you dive straight into the hospital and your observations. Uh, so there's about a six to eight week period where you are spending all of your time uh, observing in the, the Stanford Hospital and other uh, associated uh, healthcare facilities. Once you finish uh, with your observations, you'll be gathering and writing need statements throughout. Those need statements form the basis for the projects that you will be uh, uh, taking forward and even as you are observing, we are uh, helping you filter those needs down to a, a manageable number that you can uh, use to launch forward into your concept generation. So we spend a lot of time uh, crafting your need statements here at Biodesign. Uh, we, we really believe fundamentally a well-written need statement is the, the firm foundation that you need to build a innovative technology on top of. By the time you've come down to eight to 12 need statements, you'll begin concept generation. Uh, that's another generative process where you're trying to create as many concepts as possible that fit and, and solve the need that you've identified. Through a process uh, of risk identification and of deeper learning, you will start to then hone those concepts down to a final set of uh, between two and four uh, concepts and needs that you will really begin the implementation process with. And during the, the, the final phase of, of biodesign, the implementation phase, you will then build those projects forward uh, by looking at the intellectual property regulatory, commercial, and clinical aspects of those, of those projects. And during that process, some of those will eventually fall out and typically teams uh, exit the program having uh, identified two to three primary uh, needs and projects that they've really built up. Uh, we believe strongly that a diverse set of fellows uh, is how you generate a diverse number of concepts and needs. And so we, we build teams of four fellows who work together throughout the, the fellowship year. And those typically come from backgrounds uh, both in engineering and science, as well as, uh, as healthcare uh, delivery and strategy. So you'll see if you look through our former fellows that we have these highly diverse teams that come together to, to accomplish this innovation. Um, one last part of the fellowship that is important to, to discuss as well is that there is an externship opportunity. Um, this is a one month period of time that's customizable to what you would like to do. And it's where you can use it to go out and work in a local company, uh, an incubator, a design firm, a, a startup, a venture capitalist, to get a better understanding of potential career paths uh, through the industry. So uh, with all of that, you then uh, get to the end of the program uh, in, in the first week of June uh, and graduate and have the potential to take those projects forward if you desire. We do have mechanisms for funding projects uh, that are uh, that, that, that are 
that where we have fellows that are willing to take those forward. Uh, or you can uh, use the fellowship as a way to then return to training or launch into a career in medical technology. So that's your brief overview of what the fellowship year looks like. Um, what I want to do is, is open up for some roundtable questions with our panelists to uh, address uh, some, quick, some quick questions. We'll do this as a, 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 where everyone can give just some, some quick feedback. So the first question is for my panelists, what was your favorite part of the fellowship year? I'll, I'll take that one. I mean, as, as an engineer, um, by, by far, my favorite part was clinical immersion. So um, being there in an operating room, being there in the clinic, hearing firsthand from the patients what their pain points were, and then having the side conversations with the, with the healthcare providers, whether it was the doctors or the nurses, what their pain points were, and really digging deep into, um, into their day-to-day. Uh, was fascinating and not something that I had visibility to, right? Which is a different experience, I'm sure, than what Vic had, um, having come from that background. So, um, so I better understood the what you know as an engineer the ways that I could that I could help these people in their in their day to day lives and um, getting that firsthand experience um, and understanding the true unmet clinical needs from the horse's mouths, if you will, um, was was transformational for me. And I think critical for any engineer wanting to, to work in, in med tech. I, th I think, you know, as well, 100% um, agree with Drea. And um, the thing for me that has been different now being outside on the corporate uh, side is that, you know, corporate companies do a lot of sort of clinical immersion or case observations. Um, but that's completely different from the kind of immersion that you'll experience in biodesign where you literally can walk into almost any place in the hospital, start asking questions, you're wearing sort of the Stanford lab coat, and it's, it's not as if you're part of a company disrupting the normal process of care, um, and you don't have to leave, uh, um, you know, the, the real interesting parts, the pre-surgery, the post-surgery, the clinical workup. Um, whereas if you're part of a company doing immersions, you're really just watching your device get used, um, which is a completely uh, different dynamic in, in biodesign. So completely agree with Shreya. All right. Yeah. Vic, how about you guys? Uh, probably yeah. not the same sense. No, for, for me, I uh, would like um, totally agree also with Rush and Shreya, but uh, what absolutely what I loved about the program uh, was the whole team aspect. And so uh, particularly coming from uh, traditionally more or originally from uh, uh, more of a medical background, the ability to closely work together in a team, also with people with an engineering and a business background um, was, besides it was so much fun and sometimes also really difficult, um, was really one of the key and unique parts of the, about the program, at least for me at that time. Um, and uh, I think on top of it also the, the ecosystem that you enter. And so with biodesign, it's not just a, the educational program um, that you get, but also everyone that's involved with it. Um, and uh, there's so many people uh, with so many diverse types of backgrounds that support the biodesign program. Um, that, that's one of the, the whole community that you get afterwards and also during the program, just uh, so, so inspiring and so helpful. Yeah, I, I think I would echo everything uh, that's been said. Um, you know, coming from a, a medical background, we, we tend to get tunnel vision and think about things a very specific way. Uh, and as Vivian stated, um, when, once you get exposure to a much broader range of individuals with very different backgrounds, you learn how to think from different perspectives, um, which was to me the most valuable aspect of the year, just working on a team with engineers and scientists and learning how they think about problems and how they approach problems which caused me to be able to take a step back from the way that I typically address problems, um, which has benefited me even in my medical career as well. Um, so I, I you know, absolutely agree that the people that we meet and work with um, was, was huge for me. Great. All right, so then uh, uh, Vic, you can start with this one. What was the biggest challenge of the fellowship year for you then? 
Uh, I'd also say coming from a medical background, um, we're not used to working in a, a team structure where there's no hierarchy. Um, we're used to there being a very strict hierarchy of orders are given and orders are followed. Where in biodesign, it's a very flat structure on the team. And when you have four individuals who all think very differently about problems, uh, it can be a challenge to figure out how that team is gonna work well together and make tough decisions together um, and communicate uh, in a way that maintains those friendships. So that was something that our team had to learn at the very beginning of the year. And it's been an extremely valuable skill set um, to learn moving forward, especially as the field of medicine is evolving into much less of a hierarchical uh, nature and into more of a team uh, sort of uh, dynamic. I, I think the skills that I learned 10 years ago, I still continue to apply now. I have to totally echo what Zick is saying because that was for, I think for any team in biodesign, kind of the, the learn to all work together uh, and particularly coming from a medical background. Um, it, so, so it's the most fun part of working in a team together, but it's also the, the most challenging part, particularly in the beginning. Uh, what's really uh, awesome about biodesign and uh, I think it also shows how forward thinking they were early on was that they involved um, a uh, psychologist, uh, Doug, uh, that helps the team um, grow and work on these types of issues or work through uh, these types of issues and, and grow together. Um, and so these were our bi-weekly shrink sessions uh, where in a very safe space, we can work on our, our team uh, dynamics um, and, and the issues or the challenges people that we were facing. And it was really instrumental for, um, for effectively uh, being able to work together. Right. Shreya or Rush? Yeah, the one thing I was going to bring up is, again, kind of from an engineer standpoint, one of the things that that's certainly a core tenet of biodesign as you're going through the observation and need generation process is to remain solution agnostic, which, you know, is a, is a nice way of, of ensuring that you're focusing on what the true clinical unmet need is. And um, I think it's natural for people who have a technical background who are engineers to kind of jump to solutions. Um, and that was certainly a, a challenging aspect for me um, to jump to solutions and problems that I see instead of, it, it took some discipline to try and refocus to what the clinical need was and making sure we spent enough time to clearly define what that was and get all the different perspectives required. Um, certainly the team dynamic was also a challenge, but I think um, the solution agnostic nature of the process was, was probably at the top of the list for me. For me, it was uh, time. I mean, you, you, you think, you know, 10 months is a fairly long bit of time, but it's uh, the best way to describe it. It's like going to Walt Disney World and you only have two days to ride whatever you want. Everything's free and you got to take advantage of it. And it's, it's, it's incredible and amazing. And you see just amazing learning experience after amazing learning experience go right by you because there's even better places to spend your time. And um, it, it was a, a, a wonderful sort of career accelerator in a lot of ways, but, but just an eye-opening experience from a, from a life journey perspective because of all the um, you know, research talks at Stanford that are constantly going on plus observations, plus experience with your team, both on a, on a project building perspective, but also on a, on a personal relationship building perspective, because all of us are you know, now off and on doing amazing things. And the number of biodesign fellows that I call on, on a you know, monthly or weekly basis for questions, for support, for um, you know, answers to things that are um, needing answers, it, it's, uh, it's an incredible network that you, you build along the way, but it's, it's that figuring out how to spend your time wisely is uh, was the most challenging for me. Great, thanks, Rush. Um, I'm going to combine the next two questions together because I think they 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 work together. Uh, and and I'd be I'm going to be really interested to hear what your um, what your your answers are here. So the the, the combo uh, question is what caused you to apply to biodesign in the first place? And then how did the fellowship change your career path? I can start with that. Um, 
I never thought I would do anything in engineering or business. Um, I was, again, you know, very focused on medicine, medicine, and had my entire 30 year career already mapped out. Um, during residency, as I began to utilize more and more medical devices in my delivery of care to patients, I realized how some of those devices were truly transformative in the way that care was delivered, either making uh, procedures safer, um, making outcomes better, reducing complications, allowing us to treat more patients in the same amount of time. And at the same time, I began to have my own ideas about devices that I felt would be really useful in clinical practice. And that's what started me down the pathway of searching for ways to learn what to do with those ideas and ways to integrate uh, devices more into my practice um, in order to scale my ability to treat patients uh, either better or um, more efficiently in my practice. And that's what led me to biodesign and, and caused me to really change the trajectory of my career, as, as many others have stated. Um, now I, I primarily work at my medical device company and then practice part time. So definitely was transformative to my career. When I was a, um, an undergraduate in chemical engineering, um, my goal was to switch majors into biomedical engineering and it never happened. Um, and so my only choice at that point was to go find some sort of master's program to get a degree in biomedical engineering. And I was just fortunate enough to stumble across uh, the Stanford Biodesign program. And I thought, wow, a year and, you know, you get some kind of certificate. This is great. And there's no classes, no exams. Um, didn't really know what it was at the time. Um, started to learn more about it and got really enamored by this idea of clinical immersion, cross-functional teams, Silicon Valley. Um, to the point where I started clicking on people's resumes who were current fellows and was super intimidated, um, really uh, depressed actually, it was Vic's year. Um, it was Vic's resume and a few others on his team that I was looking at um, and they had done so much and I was sitting there with a bachelor's degree um, from the University of Texas and I um, made a decision at that point to change the next four years of my academic career um, to apply to get a PhD, to go get an MBA, to do startup experiences and all these hackathons and things for the purpose of maybe being competitive enough on my resume to get into biodesign. Um, so in terms of how my career changed, just, just the fact that it existed changed my whole academic uh, trajectory to kind of make a hard left turn over to California. Uh, but then even through the program, I remember um, when I got the call to get accepted to the program, I was sitting there with a, with a startup that had just gotten a term sheet for a series A. I was just about to finish my PhD and I thought, wow, I don't really need biodesign anymore because I've kind of done what I would have expected to come out of biodesign. Um, and I could not have been more wrong. Um, there, there have been so many amazing doors that have been opened um, by being in the community by uh, all the education that is completely different from what's in the textbook that you get by going through and having the mentorship from people like Sandy and, and Vic and others. Um, and so I would say that, um, you know, my life is completely different uh, than it would be in a thousand ways uh, because of going to biodesign. Uh, Vivian, how about you? Yeah, um, similar as, as Vic, you know, I always thought I was going to be a practicing clinician, uh, and um, and I already like before I had always like a, an interest in innovation and technology, uh, and at that time, um, the university system in the Netherlands um, and the majority of Europe, unfortunately, they don't really support having dual degrees, um, and so I kind of find my own way. Um, uh, after pursuing a middle or, or during while I was pursuing a medical degree of getting more exposure uh, to healthcare uh, technology innovation um, and uh, at the uh, ERCOT in France, which is a minimal invasive surgery institute where I spent four years. I worked a lot with companies on their medical device products and testing them in animal settings and clinical settings, et cetera. Um, and that's also where I first learned about uh, biodesign. And it was probably in 2010 or 2011. 
Um, and similar as Rush, I decided to kind of make a plan for how to how to get there because same thing. I would look at the the resumes of people and I was like, oh my goodness, um, these are such impressive and incredible people. I want to be part of that. How can I become part of that as well? Uh, and so really start to work towards that. Uh, uh, focus more on incorporating um, innovation in my in my daily projects and interests and uh, did another fellowship in um, surgical education and innovation at Stanford uh, and eventually got into the program, which was super exciting. Um, and that changed completely my career. Uh, after the program, uh, I decided I loved it so much that I didn't want to uh, pursue a clinical career, but really focus on uh, healthcare technology development. And then the question was, well, you're an MD, but you're not uh, really, uh, because I never finished my residency. Uh, um, so what's the role going to be for me in companies or how is my career going to look like? So it was a little bit of a, of a scary step um, uh, to take. Um, but eventually by, and also what helped a lot was are the externships so that kind of allowed uh, as well to explore, well, what other types of, or how can I, uh, bring value to uh, different types of companies and what types of skill sets are useful. Uh, and I did it at the time at uh, Longitude Capital, which is um, uh, a venture capital firm based here in, in among others here in, uh, uh, in the Bay Area, um, and really saw that uh, where I could bring value was um, around uh, business development strategies, uh, risk analysis, due diligence, et cetera. And so started to pursue that pathway and working with different companies in uh, working on their BD types of strategies um, uh, moving forward and which I still think I absolutely love. Yeah, so for me, I, um, you know, when I, when I applied to biodesign, I was still working at FDA and, uh, and I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty unique background to come in with a regulatory experience. So um, I did, you know, was similarly intimidated by everybody I saw on, on Biodesign's website, um, but saw that I also had perhaps something unique to offer with that regulatory background, and uh, and and so was a little more perhaps bullish and, and decided to apply right away. Um, but you know, the I think the the biggest thing that that I learned in the in the application process was um, it's really about the program looks for you know evaluate on, on what we're evaluated on what we bring to the program um, more than more than what we've already accomplished. And I think that was, you know, that was primarily why I decided to apply when I did. Um, I also just personally did not want to be sort of pigeonholed into being a regulatory person uh, in med tech uh, for the rest of my career and really appreciated and, and still appreciate the holistic nature of what biodesign teaches in terms of how to really make a successful product um, in, in the healthcare space, which is obviously multifaceted with all the different stakeholders involved, including regulatory, including payers on the reimbursement side, and um, obviously developing you know, business, uh, business plans, business strategy, um, and, and you know, going through all those hurdles to create a successful product is something I just, from an educational standpoint, was just something I wanted to learn more about. And, I also did not have entrepreneurial ambitions that obviously changed by the end of the fellowship, um, but I really was going in thinking of it as a true educational opportunity, not really knowing what was coming on the other end of it. And, um, and obviously ended up starting a, a company out of it that, that we're still running. So, um, so that, that changed, but it was, it was really, I embraced wanting to learn all of those different facets and, you know, to speak to, I think, something Vivian brought up earlier, um, there's so many resources at your fingertips through Stanford Biodesign, so many people who are experts in regulatory, in reimbursement, um, in developing business plans, and having that wealth of resources definitely changed my career tra trajectory. Great. Uh Thank you guys all for, for such great and, and complete answers. Um, I'm seeing a lot of stuff continue to come up in, in the, the Q&A over here on the side. And those of you who are participating in the webinar, I encourage you to ask your questions in the Q&A. No question is too, uh, is too silly or is too, um, 
you know, it, we're, we're open to answering any question that you've got, um, throw it out there. We, we'd, uh, we really want to hear from you. So I know, uh, Vic, you've answered a couple of these in the, um, and Rush as well in the chat. Was there anything you wanted to, uh, to build on in terms of what you guys have seen in the Q&A so far uh, that, that you want to build on? Otherwise, we can move to some of the open questions. Uh, nothing that I wanted to build on, but there's definitely an open one um, around the application screening process and what the program looks for in applicants that I think would be pretty valuable. And we're seeing a couple of questions about that. Sure. Um, well, why don't I address that? Um, one of the things you'll see when you read the application is that we ask for a number of different essays from you. Um, and what we're really trying to get an understanding there is about the skill set that you bring to biodesign. As you can imagine, it's it's um, it's our goal to put together very diverse teams, but that also means that we don't have a strict uh, template of what a perfect fellow looks like. And so, what we what we look for the application to do is to give us a window into what skills you're bringing to the program, and those skills could be uh, based on your educational background. Um, or your clinical background, but we also want you to highlight your skill sets in five specific areas. So we're looking for people who, who come uh, with evidence of creativity, leadership, problem solving, communication, and teamwork. So wherever you can highlight those five skill sets in your application, that gives us a window into how you're gonna work on a team that is highly diverse and non-hierarchical and where you're, you're really focused on experiential learning. Um, I would say that uh, we, we don't look for a specific cookie cutter type of fellow. And so uh, bring, you know, bring your whole self, tell us your story. And, uh, and then from there, uh, we, we select approximately 35 people to come to interviews. And then from those 35 people, we hone it down to 12 who are selected for the fellowship itself. One thing to add is that um, it's, it's pretty common actually for people to apply uh, to interview even, and then to not make it, and then to apply the next year and then to make it. Um, it's, it's not as if, um, so it's a very competitive process of course, um, but with, with four people on each team and with a need to have um, sort of a different sets of skills in each one of those four seats of, you know, a builder, a clinician, a scientist, and a sort of an operational business person, um, there could be some years where, let's say, 80 of the 90 applicants are doctors or is a hyperbole. Um, where it could be very hard to get in if you have a particular type of, of educational or experiential background, whereas the next year, it might be completely the opposite. Um, so I would say if this is part of your life goal um, to do this as part of your career, um, you know, be persistent, and it may take more than one year, uh, but it is definitely worth it. And there's many people <laughs> that have applied uh, multiple times and interviewed even multiple times uh, before being accepted. Great. Um, let's see, what other things uh, do I think we should address here? Gosh, you guys have gone through all the Q&A and answered all of them. I love it. Um, there are a couple of things that, that might be worth uh, talking about. Um, I think it's worth talking about externships. And I think it's also uh, worth talking about um, if you decide to take a project forward, what the opportunities are uh, for taking projects forward. Uh, so, Vic, I know you talked about where you did your externship. Uh, why don't the rest of you as, as um, uh, panelists tell us about where you did your externships and what your plan with, was with, uh, with your externship? Yeah, I can go. I mean, I, I decided to take on an externship in, in Galway, Ireland. Um, and the, the reason why I chose that particular opportunity is because it was it was helping an early stage startup with the regulatory, their regulatory process through FDA and getting a, a pre-submission into FDA to start an early stage clinical trial. And um, for me, it was a little bit of a trial of 
would I, do I want to work in the regulatory realm and continue that thread of my career or do I want to switch to something else, including this potentially really exciting project that we have going on um, and being becoming sort of more of a generalist, if you will, by, by helping to lead that company. So, um, so I, you know, it was more of, it was a trial, it was a trial period for me um, just to understand what I, what I might want to do or might not want to do after the fellowship program. Rush, how about you? Yeah, happy to. Oh, or Vivian, great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I, I did my uh, externship at Longitude Capital, a uh, venture capital firm here in the Bay Area. Um, uh, for me, that was also really a game changer. It um, was one of the reasons why, uh, what I, I absolutely love doing it. So what I basically did during my externship uh, was uh, I got, dove into making a landscape assessment uh, where, uh, or to find opportunities for them to invest um, in the at that time in the stroke space um, uh, was extremely valuable. Uh, I learned a lot uh, within that period, um, and um, that experience uh, still helps me uh, with my my current role. Um, I work with a lot of corporate venture capital and venture capital firms and private equity and hedge funds. Uh, and support them also with making uh, or doing opportunity assessments. Uh, and besides that, uh, of, you know, where to look for opportunities and to evaluate them, uh, also um, uh, helping them with selecting the right companies and doing due diligence, et cetera, on them. Um, and I think it's not just um, the externship, but then also applying the biodesign process really helps them uh, these types of uh, investment firms and, and trying to understand, um, uh, you know, what uh, what value does this company bring? What is the potential of this company? Uh, and uh, combining that with having also a medical background really created um, uh, or allowed me to have a unique skill set within um, uh, the uh, Monat Phelps and Phillips. And so we're the, the firm is close to 800 people. Um, and uh, I would probably be the only one within the firm that has that very particular skill set of both having a medical background and having uh, a biodesign background uh, while also working uh, uh, with a BD. Um, in my externship, I did at a company called Foresight Labs. So there's only a handful of um, you know true medical technology incubators across the country. Uh, and even fewer of them that are um, sort of serially successful. Um, it just so happens that um, you know almost all of them are affiliated with biodesign in some way. And Foresight Labs is one of those incubators, but in the ophthalmology space. Um, the company I worked at was designing a new type of drug delivery device. Um, it's since been acquired by, by Allergan, but I got to come in at a very specific point in that, that product development life cycle um, and apply the technical skills I had on the drug delivery side, um, but also really get to see a, a company that was sort of at the mid stage of the startup life cycle. Um, and that helped prepare me um, while going through sort of the earlier stages of, of what best practice looks like of where to go in launching something after the fellowship. So um, incredibly valuable experience and, and a networked door that doesn't really open to too many people um, unless you have sort of a biodesign type of an affiliation um, that allows you to have a, a one month kind of flyby of, of somebody else's rocket ship. Great, uh, thanks Rush. I, I've seen two questions in the, the Q&A that uh, I, I think either Rush or Trey, if you guys would, would comment on um, the facilities available for making prototypes and sort of what level of prototype you uh, you get to through the fellowship year? Yeah, so we um, we did really fundamental, you know, prototypes that, that look, looks like prototypes, works like prototypes um, in, in the, the product realization lab um, and the, the lab just within biodesign and use the equipment there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, generous biodesign alums who, who will come and bring catheters and things for you to, to play with and prototype with and design, you know, design your prototype with. And um, after that kind of fundamental 
prototype work is when we ended up graduating um, onto you know, a larger lab where we could do a little bit more work or working with a contract manufacturer to get a little bit more specific. So it's really kind of looks like, works like prototypes um, should probably be the expectation of what you will, what you will do within the walls of, of biodesign. Yeah, and I, and I would say, um, you know, when when I did the interviews and they take you on the tour and you get to see all the, you know, CNC machines and the 3D printers and laser cutters, I mean, the, anything you would ever want is there. It's like a, a very typical university maker space that's extremely well stocked because it's Stanford. Um, but I was... Um, not not disappointed, but I think enlightened by going through the process that it's really not about that at all. It's about finding the right unmet clinical needs and then um, finding the simplest way to validate the key risk that would prevent you from being successful. So in our case, we ran a 15 patient IRB approved study during the fellowship year for one of our projects by taking an existing approved medical device that was used in bronchoscopy and applying that device in an ICU population. So we didn't prototype anything, but we got invaluable clinical data through that sort of, um, you know, hack it kind of innovation model. Um, you also have access to cadaver lab facilities if you want that. Um, and, and so um, there's ways to kind of get a lot of really valuable information within the walls of Stanford that have nothing to do with, you know, learning how to use a 3D printer, but there is that if you want it. Great, I see yeah, it. Oh, go ahead. Right. Yeah, uh, to build on top of what Russian and Shreya are saying, besides like the actual physical resources, uh, the human resources is, are like incredible because it's um, it's not just the biodesign community, but if you are struggling uh, with a certain technology or you need to learn about something more, uh, you can email anyone from the, the other schools, from the School of Engineering or, uh, the design school, the business school, um, and normally if you tell them that you're from biodesign, um, they will be uh, more than happy to meet up with you and help you trying to solve your problem. It's a really, a, it's an open community, which is amazing. Great, so I see, I'm, I'm just kind of looking at the, the open questions. I wanna make sure we've got two questions here that are talking about non-MD uh, backgrounds in healthcare, right? So health practitioners who, who um, haven't gone through an MD track and uh, biodesign is open to those people who are uh, 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 of, of any different clinical background. Uh, we're primarily looking for a, a diverse set of healthcare backgrounds. And we are looking for people who have experience in the patient care setting and who have a, a breadth of clinical background. Um, like Rush made a comment uh, earlier, we tend to have archetypes of fellows in a very rough sense. And I'm saying very rough sense in that we have typically clinicians, strategists, uh, engineers and scientists, and many of our fellows have multiple backgrounds in, in one or the other. Um, so I, I saw a question about a mixed background of a pharmacy and MBA background. Um, all of those, those backgrounds are, are, are ones you should uh, uh, view as being accepted into the program. What we're going to want to see in your application is that you have um, uh, it, you have demonstrated those five skill sets that, that we talked about earlier, and that you have some experiences in innovation that have really um, helped you determine that this is the, the direction that you want to go, um, that have, have um, that you've put your toe in the water, and that you've, you've had uh, an experience in, in uh, uh, innovation that has really showed you that, that you're excited about this, this focus area and that you're ready to really make it something that is part of your career. Uh, anyone else wanna build on that or add to that? Um, yeah, no, I would also, uh, to, to second what you say, uh, what you're um, saying, Sandy, um, I think is of huge value is to have people in the program that don't necessarily have a traditional background. So if you have like a pharmacy background or something else, but as Lucene was saying, 
Um, but you can demonstrate why this is relevant to you um, and uh, why you will be relevant to the program, you know, go for it. Uh, I couldn't, you know, if I would have had someone with a pharmacy background in our team, I would have loved it. Uh, a lot of the clients I work with currently are, are big pharmaceutical companies. And so, absolutely. And, and I would say the definition of what a, you know, a typical fellow is, has changed enormously over the last 22 years. Um, where, you know, traditionally in the you know, early 2000s, this was a medical device focused fellowship. Um, but we have software companies, we have drug companies, we have services companies, uh, in addition to, of course, devices. And so the, the tent of what um, defines med tech innovation has expanded enormously. And along with that requires uh, a need for a lot of new types of skill sets, not just your typical sort of engineer, doctor, MBA. Uh, but but far and beyond that. Great, thanks, Rush. Uh, Vic, it looked like there was one you were going to answer live. Uh, yes, there was a question about balancing um, working as a physician and um, entrepreneurship, and I think I, I will answer that a little more broadly as to what careers we typically see uh, uh, fellows that have MDs take after the fellowship. And I would broadly divide them into three categories. We have a number of MDs who do the fellowship and then go back into full-time practice, taking the skills that they learned during the fellowship and applying them in their clinical practice, um, not necessarily starting their own company or working uh, as a consultant um, at a larger company, but actually in their practice being innovative um, as far as policies, procedures within the hospital. Uh, we also see MDs uh, like Vivian who decide to work in innovation full-time and not practice. And then we have um, multiple MDs who have formed a more hybrid sort of career. Um, all of them have their own you know, pros and cons. Uh, I would say for me personally, um, a hybrid between entrepreneurship and practicing in the hospital um, was possible because the field that I work in uh, allows for shift work. So I work as a trauma surgeon doing trauma shifts where throughout the life cycle of our startup company, I could modify the amount that I worked in the hospital um, to accommodate the amount of time that I needed to spend on the startup. And I constantly strove to find this balance um, of working enough in the hospital and also dedicating enough time uh, to the company. So that's a very personal decision um, that, you know, a lot of factors um, need to be considered. Uh, but what I will say is it's definitely possible to build your career in any way that you'd like, um, just recognizing some of the pros and cons and the challenges and difficulties that are associated with any of those choices. Great. Thanks, Vic. Yeah, I would say that that there are numerous innovation programs a, a, around the United States based out of um, uh, uh, medical schools that have been founded or started by biodesign fellows who, who um, continue to practice and go back into academic medicine. Uh, I think as we continue to expand to healthcare uh, uh, roles, rather than just being an MD-focused uh, uh, clinical pool of, of uh, fellows and alumni fellows, you'll start seeing those same kinds of things happen in the other types of fields where, where folks are uh, coming into the program from. Uh, let's see, I'm just looking through the questions. I see a lot of you guys typing answers to questions. So this is great. We're getting uh, uh, these going. Rush, I see one you targeted that you're gonna answer live. So why don't you go for that one? And so th this question was really about sort of at what stage is it too early to apply to biodesign? What, it, what does a typical fellow kind of look like um, in terms of experience? And I would say, um, you know, the, the guidelines here that I'm going to provide are just guidelines. There, there are people that are exceptions to both sides of the spectrum, but there are not too many fellows that get into the program uh, before the age of like 25 or 26. That's kind of the, the youngest uh, edge. And the reason for that is just you haven't accomplished enough by that time, usually, to have a resume that stacks up against a lot of people that are coming in. 
Um, the, the average age in the program has, has sort of crept up year by year as it's become more competitive and more popular. Um, you know, typically in your, your early 30s, late 20s, mid 30s, um, it's kind of, there's a hodgepodge of people. The doctors are usually, uh, you know, uh, more senior, um, but, uh, but not by much because again, it's very competitive. And so uh, not uncommon for someone to have a PhD and also a few years of work experience. Uh, but if you have a, a bachelor's or a master's and you have, you know, five to 10 years of work experience and it's a really cool project set and, and to Shreya and Sandy's point, you bring something unique to the program, um, then yeah, you're going to be extremely competitive, um, irrespective of whatever academic uh, pedigree you may or may not have. So um, it's about finding um, your voice and your skill sets along the way that enables your application to be competitive um, with the noticeable focus on diversity of skill sets and backgrounds. And then there was another question, um, you know, that was there that I, it was, uh, is there enough time to sort of do a master's at the same time that you're doing by design? And, uh, I would say, no, there's no time really to do much of anything. Uh, there, there are people that sort of attempt to either do like a, uh, you know, a moonlight for a couple of nights but usually they get burned really fast because um, there's just not enough time. You wake up in the morning and you're, you know, you're there by eight and you're excited to be there because there's just so much to do. Uh, there's meetings and events and things back to back. You might go home and see your family sometime in the afternoon. Um, and then you might be back a couple nights a week for different networking events. Um, these are sort of the seminal med tech innovators that'll come in and, you know, be at these, uh, parties or conferences or whatever it is, and it's a huge opportunity to learn. And so you'll you want to sort of take advantage. So it, you you're going to be spending a lot of time, uh, and your teammates are going to be um, your second family, and you may spend more time with them during the fellowship year than you do your actual families. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. I think the most fellows feel like the program is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and there are a ton of things to learn in a very short period of time. Um, so we definitely recommend a serious focus on um, the program, the process, and your team projects in order to make sure that uh, we're able to provide the benefits to each fellow going through this educational process as possible. Um, so definitely recommend not having um, other uh, commitments that might interfere with that. Right, but I will, I will also say, you know, as someone who did the fellowship with two young children, it is possible to have work-life balance between it. Um, we, we've commented a couple of times about how we have a team psychologist. Uh, one of the foundational things that, that um, Dr. Rate has each team do at the beginning of the year is set up their expectations for how they're going to work together. And that's very important for people who come from very different lifestyles to agree on and decide how they're going to work together. So regardless of how you need to, um, to, to define your, your time because of family commitments, you will be able to accomplish that as a fellow. So I would not feel like um, the fact that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity means that you have to pour every inch of your life into the fellowship at the same time. We do uh, encourage and, and help facilitate uh, it, it, a a workable uh, uh, balance between your fellowship year and your uh, and your family commitments. All right, we're closing in on the end of time here. Uh, I see one last question here. Um, uh, uh, let's uh, let's address it. Uh, let's see, which was, what's one thing you would do differently or approach differently if you were starting the fellowship year this August? So we'll do this as a lightning round. Rush, Vic, Shreya, Vivian, you each get about, you know, call it 20 seconds to, to answer the question. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more, more clinical immersion. Yeah. We always ended up going back to clinical immersion. We kind of still do. We, you can never get enough of that. 
I would say um, taking advan more advantage of the network that we're introduced to uh, during the fellowship. You know, every day we seem to be getting introduced to some new big time CEO or very important person. Uh, and I think it's easy to take it for granted. Yeah, same as Rush, nothing like, yeah. <laughs> it was so well organized from uh, the faculty point of view and uh, the admins and staff. Uh, it was awesome. Great. Um, Megan, do you want to make a quick announcement about whether the uh, questions that were answered in the Q&A, um, is there a way for us to post those on the, um, on the website or show those alongside the recording? Yes, um, I am not sure if they will be with the webinar recording itself, but we can collect um, and disseminate on the website all of the questions and the answers that were done in the Q&A so that everyone has access to that. All right, and I would say thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, there are additional answers to questions on the FAQ uh, page at Biodesign. So, uh, and, and you can always have access to Megan if you have additional questions. So with that, we'll sign off. Thanks so much everybody for joining and thank you to my panelists for being here. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you.